down. Moses, way down in Egypt land, tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. I was born in Tuckahoe, Talbot County, Maryland. I have no accurate knowledge of my age, never having seen an authentic record containing it by far. The larger part of slaves know as little of their ages as horses do of theirs. And it is the wish of most masters, to my knowledge, to keep their slaves thus ignorant. I do not ever remember having met a slave who could tell me of his birthday. They seldom come nearer to it than planting time, harvest time, cherry time, springtime or fall. My mother was named Harriet Bailey. She was the daughter of Isaac and Betsy Bailey, both colored and quite dark. My mother was of a darker complexion than either my grandmother or grandfather. My father was a white man. He was admitted to be such by all that I had ever heard speak of my parentage. The rumor was also whispered that my master was my father. But of the correctness of this opinion, I know nothing. My mother and I were separated when I was but an infant, before I knew her as my mother. It is a common custom in that part of Maryland from which I ran away to part children from their mothers at a very early age. I never saw my mother to know her as such more than four or five times in my life. And each of those times was very short in duration and at night. She was hired by a Mr. Stewart, who lived about 12 miles from my home. She made her journeys to see me in the night, traveling the whole distance on foot after the performance of a day's work. She was a field hand, and a whipping is the penalty for not being in the field at sunrise, unless a slave has special permission from his master to the contrary, a permission which they seldom get. I do not recollect ever seeing my mother by the light of day. She was with me in the night. She would lie down with me get me to go to sleep. But long before I would awake, she was gone. She died when I was about seven years old. I was not allowed to be present during her illness, at her death, or burial. My master was Colonel Lloyd's clerk and superintendent. He was what might be called the overseer of overseers. I was seldom whipped by my old master, and suffered from little from anything other than hunger and cold. I suffered much from hunger, but much more from cold. In the hottest summers and coldest winters, I was kept almost naked. No shoes, no, no stockings, no trousers, no jacket. Nothing on but a shirt, reaching only to my knees. I must have froze from the cold, but that on the coldest night I would, I would steal a bag, which was used for carrying corn to the meal. 
I would crawl into this bag and there lay on the cold, damp clay floor with my head and feet out. Why my feet have been so cracked with the frost that the pen with which I am writing might be filled in the gazers. Our food was coarse cornmeal boiled. It was put into a, a large tray or trowel and then set down upon the ground. And then the children were called like so many little pigs. And, so, and like so many pigs, they would come and devour the mush. Some with oyster shells, some with pieces of shingle, some with naked hands and none with spoons. I look upon my departure from Colonel Lloyd's plantation as one of the most interesting events in my life. It is possible, and even quite probable, that I should today, if I had not been removed from the plantation to Baltimore, I should today, instead of having here, be in the enjoyment of freedom and the happiness of home, writing this narrative, being confined to the galling chains of slavery. Going to Baltimore laid the foundation and opened the gateway to all my subsequent prosperity. I regard the selection of myself as being somewhat remarkable. There were a number of slave children that might have been sent from the plantation to Baltimore, but I was chosen from among them all and was the first, last, and only choice. Very soon, after I went to live with Mr. and Mrs. Auld, Mrs. Auld very kindly commenced to teach me the ABCs. After I had learned this, she assisted me in learning to spell words of three or four letters. But just at this point of my progress, Mr. Auld, found out what was going on, and at once forbid Mrs. All from instructing me further, telling her that it was unlawful, as well as unsafe, to teach a slave to read. To use his own words further, he said, if you give a nigger an inch, he will take an L. A nigger should know nothing but to obey his master and to do as he is told to do. Learning would spoil the best nigger in the world. Now, if you teach that nigger, speaking of myself, how to read, there would be no keeping him. He would at once become unmanageable and unfit to his master. As to himself, it would do him no good, but a great deal of harm. He would become discontented and unhappy. These words sank deep into my heart and stirred up sentiments within that lay slumber and called into existence an entirely new train of thought to what had been, to me, a most perplexing situation. I now understood what had been, to me, a most perplexing situation. To wit, the white man's power to enslave the black man. It was a grand achievement, and I prized it highly. And whilst I was saddened by the thought of losing the aid of my kind mistress, I was gladdened by the invaluable instruction which I had received by the merest of accidents through my master. Though conscious of the difficulty of learning to read without a teacher, I set out with high hopes and a fixed purpose, at whatever cost, to learn to read. 